uh, I want to first of all thank Jack for his welcome to country. Paul Heatherstone, who's the chief executive of the Department of Infrastructure for uh, Energy and Mining, conveyed to me uh, a, a better understanding of what actually the welcome to country is. It's a it's a sign of vulnerability. Um, Jack doesn't know the people in this room, yet he's welcoming us all to his country. And it's a gift that we're given by traditional owners. And what they ask for us in return is that acknowledgement, and they ask for us in return a level of respect and understanding. And I think it's actually a, a, a very beautiful way of us acknowledging uh, the oldest continuous civilization anywhere in the world. Uh, and it is a, 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 a something that deserves thanks. So thank you, Jack, again for your, your welcome. My job today as minister is to do a bit of scene setting, to talk about what the government's ambitions are, what the overall government strategy is, and what it is we're looking for to partner with, um, um, with industry. So let me first start by thanking you all for being here and uh, I also want to thank you for taking your time to be here so early in the morning to go through this, uh, this process. We've done some deliberate thinking about what renewable energy can actually provide South Australia and what our natural endowment of minerals can provide South Australia and what our people can help deliver us. And we've formulated that within a plan called the Prosperity Plan. Because we believe that renewable energy and our mineral resources and our people can create prosperity for the state um, in a way not seen by any other jurisdiction uh, in the country. Now, we have been a leader. Oops. We've been a leader in renewable energy and we've all gone on this long path. This path is probably a path most jurisdictions will go on. They're either on it now or about to enter it. One third coal generation, two thirds gas generation. They can go up and down depending on where your jurisdiction is. Some jurisdictions had more coal and less gas. Others had less coal and more gas. Um, we had very, very poor coal resources very, very poor lignite resources, but they served us and they served us well. Its time had come uh, and it went to an end. And in 2007, we had 1% of our power was generated by renewable energy. Today, 75% is. And we've set a target now for 2027 to be 100% net renewable energy by 2027. It is an ambitious goal, but one that I think we can meet. It's an important thing. That person standing there with his arms outstretched is the Premier. A bit to the left of that photograph is me laying face down, terrified. No, I'm joking. I didn't even go up there. <laughs> um, it's, um, the reason the Premier climbed the wind farm was to demonstrate to the people of South Australia the potential that cheap renewables have to help reindustrialisation in South Australia through the prosperity plan. And we are trying to do this in stages and we are trying to do this sequentially so people understand exactly what the formulation of the government's policy is. First step is decarbonise the grid, decarbonise our electricity production. Uh, and when I say decarbonising, I mean in a net way. So that doesn't exclude gas as a potential for firming renewable energy, which I think is an important part of any modern, modern industrialised economy, you need to be able to firm your renewables to make sure we have dispatchable power. But South Australia, through the Prosperity Plan, has an ambitious plan to produce green iron. We have some of the best uh, magnetite resources anywhere in the world, whether it's the Braemar or the Middle Bank Ranges. Uh, and the Air Peninsula there uh, on that map just to the uh, west of Wyala and west of Port Augusta and, of course, um, the, um, the Braemar to the east of Burra near the New South Wales border 
uh, some very prospective areas. And we have some high quality explorers and companies who are working there. And of course, hematite, magnetite are already being mined in the upper Spencer Gulf as we speak, feeding what is an important piece of state infrastructure, which is the steelworks. Probably one of the most important regional cities anywhere in this state is Wyala, and we have grand ambitions for it. And those ambitions for it are about green iron. So what we're attempting to do is to use our renewable resources to beneficiate that iron uh, into what we believe will be a commodity we can export. Now, most countries around the world, and I've just recently returned from Europe and Rotterdam for the world's largest hydrogen conference, and I think the rubber is starting to hit the road when it comes to the idea of exporting hydrogen. I think a lot of jurisdictions are starting to understand that that may potentially be a long way off, be very, very expensive and inefficient. What I think they are realising is that South Australia's plan, which is unique to this country, as opposed to other jurisdictions that want to export their renewable energy through the form of ammonia or, 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 or green hydrogen, is we want to use the hydrogen where we make it. <clears throat> and the reason we want to do that is we think, one, it's economically efficient to use it where you make it. Two, we have the feedstock that can be beneficiated to give you a product at the end that is decarbonised. And we also have the ability to export that through traditional shipping, which is cheaper and well understood. So what does that mean? <clears throat> it means this. There are jurisdictions around the world, whether they're Korea, Japan, China, North America or Europe, that have existing steel producing facilities that rely on their fuel sources and their ores from other jurisdictions. To decarbonise those that steel making um, industry, they would need to continue on their either existing path of importing not only the ore but the fuel source, but a decarbonised fuel source and making it energy intensive in their own jurisdictions to try and beneficiate that in a green way. Or they give up one part of the complexity of their economy, which is the beneficiation of the ore to iron, to where the fuel, uh, fuel sources are produced cheaply. That is, we want to add complexity to our economy and go up the value chain of beneficiating uh, uh, iron uh, rather than just exporting iron ore. Now, you might say, well, that's not overly ambitious. Well, I say that actually steel making will become rather expensive if you're doing it just from the basis of uh, importing a green fuel source. Now, there will be transitions along the way, uh, and I'll talk about those in a moment, but this is the government's aspiration. So the question is, well, what are we doing to try and further this aspiration? Well, just recently, the Premier has given me the task of delivering Northern Water. Northern Water is a desalination plant that ultimately will have a capacity of 260 megalitres of water on the Air Peninsula. Um, it is um, a piece of public infrastructure that is being built by the state government. We're in an um, uh, engineering study now that's costing over $200 million. Our partners are BHP, Origin, Amp, Fortescue, the South Australian government, and of course the Commonwealth government, who are pouring money into this to better understand the economics of this. Ultimately, what the state government needs to do is to build an ability for there to be an abundance of water for industrial purposes, get the social permission of the public to spend up to $6 billion on building this, and at the end of it, producing water that is affordable for industrial applications. So we're in a process of that on market. So this basically is the Goldilocks option that I have been given by the Premier. Build this, build it quickly, build it cheaply, make the water affordable, unlock the potential of green iron and copper in the upper Spencer Gulf and the mid-north of our state. It is a very, very challenging piece of infrastructure, but the government has committed $200 million total 
to this work to get an understanding, which, if you think about it, is a remarkable amount of money that we are putting in to see, uh, to make sure we get the engineering uh, done correctly on this. The step we've also taken is collapsing seven pieces of legislation into one to make sure that the regulatory framework for the production of renewable energy and hydrogen and ultimately green iron is one window to government. We've tried to simplify the entry point and exit points for your projects through one piece of legislation. Now, this legislation is ambitious. Uh, many jurisdictions around the world are trying to contemplate how best to regulate this. Most jurisdictions in Australia use a Development Act or their equivalent of a Planning and Development Act for the um, building of renewable energy um, and large off-grid or on-grid storage facilities. This legislation will govern all of it, from the cradle right through to the grave. From start to finish, one window to government. This was an exceptional body of work done by my department, which I'm exceptionally proud of. And as you can see there, it makes entire sense to have all of this done into one regulatory framework, which I believe gives us the ability to have uh, a better and quicker response time to any foreign investor or any state investor or international investor who wants to come in and use um, the regulatory framework that we have in this state. The other thing that we're offering, of course, is that we're actually putting our money where our mouth is. We're investing in hydrogen. We're investing in electrolyzers, we're investing in generation, and we're investing in storage. And we're doing so alongside those assets that we think should be beneficiated in towns like Wyala. Now, Eddie Hughes is the local member of parliament for Wyala. He's here today because the message that we want to give you in a united way is that the workforces and the people of the Upper Spencer Gulf on the Air Peninsula have a permissive view of this type of investment and are embracing the vision to make sure that a green iron can be a reality. So the state government is actually investing. So we've got Northern Water, we've done the regulatory reform, we're investing in the hydrogen and generation. One, to prove up the technology, to, to de-risk further investments, and of course to prove up other technologies. And we're doing so in a way near where these investments should be made. And I, the reason we do that is because of why we're here today. There are gaps. There's always going to be a gap. And we need to hear from you. We need to hear from you what the gaps are. What else is required? Further accessibility to natural gas. Is it, is it greater land access? Is it more water? Is it the cost of water? Is it rail? Is it roads? What are the infrastructure gaps that are required to make these programs progress? And our ambition, ultimately, is to produce green iron here and export it to the world. Now, there's a trade-off. Hot briquetted iron is efficient because it's hot and you can put it in and use it because you've got an entrenched energy source. What we're talking about is making HBI and exporting it. But the reason we think we can do it here in South Australia is because of the work we've done with our partners in Rotterdam, where we've done a very strategic piece of work about whether or not South Australia can actually produce green iron and export it to the world cost effectively. And what we've found through this study with our partnerships from the European Union and the Port of Rotterdam, is that it identified a 21% cost advantage of producing direct reduction green iron in South Australia relative to shipping the raw components to Europe. Because we're using the hydrogen where we make it. Alongside the resources that are being mined, alongside a trained workforce that's already there, with government investments in water and a regulatory framework that is being set up. So rather than what Victoria is planning or what even Western Australia is planning or even what 
other jurisdictions around the world are planning is to take the sun or the wind, convert it to an electron, add that electron to water, make hydrogen using more electrons, then get that hydrogen, either use more electrons to convert it to ammonia or freeze it to minus 253 degrees, then put it on a ship, send it alongside the ore to a beneficiation plant somewhere else, then add more electrons to it to beneficiate the iron there to use existing infrastructure. Or we get rid of that process and we beneficiate the iron alongside the mine, alongside the renewable energy, alongside the water, alongside the workforce they can do it through traditional shipping means. Now, if I had to make a bet, what would be exported first? Green iron or green hydrogen? I'm happy to take those bets because the state government is putting its money where its mouth is and now we need partners. The first part about getting partners is understanding exactly where the gaps are. And I go back to that again. Um, the EOI process that we are doing now is vitally important for the government's thinking in our budget pre preparations. Um, to produce a, a tonne of steel, you produce traditionally two tonnes of carbon. Using natural gas, you can get that right down. Good savings, 600 kilograms, 400 kilograms for a tonne, maybe even less. Good, good reductions in carbon. But ultimately, the world is moving to carbon abatement at border. They'll be enforcing that. And you will have to get steel manufacturing decarbonised. And we think we can be part of that first step. I hope you can get some benefit out of today and you get a better understanding of the government's commitment to what we've put here to you because the government is using its treasure, our dollars, that we could otherwise spend on hospitals and schools and road and other infrastructure, which we are spending on this opportunity because we believe it has the opportunity to give our people prosperity. And I don't want to disparage direct shipping law in any way. It has given this country a remarkable standard of living. And it has put us in the G20 and made us the 13th largest economy in the world. But it is time now to take advantage of our natural resources in a way we have not thought of previously and beneficiate them and add value to them and partner with other liberal democracies around the world in a time of turmoil to make sure that we can continue to trade that they can keep their steel industries operating and we can value, add value to our base commodities. I consider this a win for Australia and a win for our trading partners. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your participation. I look forward to getting the uh, outcomes of the EOI when this is completed. Uh, please uh, ask lots of questions of the panelists we have up here. They are connected to government intimately, they uh, have access to the leadership of the government uh, and we will use um, the findings from this session to further, you know, to further um, uh, assist the government in its investments on what the shortfalls might be. Thank you very much.